Welcome to the Thriving Children Podcast, the show that helps parents and teachers to put the magic back in child development. Here's your host, Claire Crew. This is episode 67 of the Thriving Children podcast. I'm Claire Crew, and in this episode, I'm talking all about the importance of nature in children's development. So here with me is Daniel and Trudy from Educated by Nature. Welcome to the show, guys. Hi, Claire. Hi, Claire. Thank you. So I'd love to start with hearing a bit about your business, what it is, and how it came to be. Well, um, Educated by Nature is a social enterprise that Daniel and I set up uh, over two years ago now. We were both teaching in an upper primary school classroom in a small independent school in Perth and we were challenged by our school principal to take our class outside to learn for two whole days per week. And at that stage, we had um, quite a few children with clinically diagnosed anxiety, um, different learning needs like ADHD um, or um, a couple of kids with autism on the autism spectrum as well. And the difference it made to the children in our class, taking them outside um, two days a week was huge. So we saw the energy of the class totally dissipate so it wasn't contained within four walls. There's a little bit more um, freedom in terms of how the children could move through the space. And really they were able to be how we have evolved a bit or were designed to be as human beings to move and change our posture um, and interact with the world so that they were more able to focus and be motivated by what they were doing because they were comfortable in that space. So we were uh, really lucky at the school. We were close to um, a natural uh, lake that was just across the road from the school, so we could use that space, but also within the school grounds. We had a, a patch of trees, usually uh, in a school, that, that space that is the out-of-bound space that the kids really want to get to, um, but in a lot of schools um, they don't have the opportunity to. So we had that space that we actually called the wild space uh, that we used as our outdoor classroom uh, for the two days a week, as Trudy said. Um, and that time in there inspired us to see the benefit that nature has on uh, not just our social and emotional well-being, um, but also the academic ability and potential that outdoor spaces and time in nature provides for children. So I guess we use that as a bit of a springboard and wanted to share that message with the wider world and, and with our colleagues in different schools. So took a bit of a leap of faith and set up Educated by Nature. And here we are today. Yeah, and so part of what you do is speaking, blogging, sharing this message, but also you run nature sessions for children, don't you? Yeah, we do. So uh, initially our idea was to work directly with um, schools and teachers, uh, and we're moving more into that now. But what we found was there was a huge cry out from families um, for things like nature playgroups, for opportunities to uh, bring a family out into nature and to support parents to see the benefits that nature can provide um, and, yeah, to provide supported, facilitated sessions in nature. So now we run um, a bunch of playgroups for uh, one- to five-year-olds. We even run uh, school holiday programs. It's a drop-and-leave program for seven- to 14-year-olds out in just local pocket parts and, and natural bushland where we, yeah, get to spend the day building cubbies, uh, lighting campfires and cooking lunch together building rafts and checking out the natural environment and all the benefits that it provides for us. And we also still work with yeah. teachers. So we train teachers in how to build up their confidence and make a start on taking learning outdoors and um, go into a few of the details of some of the, um, I guess, like secrets that we've learned mm. along the way to make <laughs> things a little bit easier um, and then do a school incursion in the style of, of a modelled a classroom lesson, so something that they could go ahead and then replicate themselves later on. And I think that's one thing that we've noticed, that it's about that modelling, it's about that hand-holding um, and with teachers as well as parents in that we kind of see that we've got a generation of parents or a generation of adults now that may not have necessarily had nature play opportunities as children or we're on that cusp where we've got a bunch of the generation who their favourite um, memories of, as uh, children are playing down the street or being called in 
um, like when it gets dark to come for dinner. But then there's also a handful and that growing handful of parents who haven't had the opportunity. So they find it really tricky to then work with their children and provide their children with opportunities that they may not have necessarily had. So the sessions that we run both for teachers and families, it's about going, this is okay and this is a way that you can do it so that hopefully they then go on to do it themselves um, and make it a part of their everyday life. Yeah, that's such a good point, Daniel. I think giving that guidance and essentially giving that permission because I think beyond just that whole idea of being outside more, it's also about a philosophy, isn't it? Yes, and that um, mentoring um, philosophy for us comes through it as well. So we don't want to come across, you know, or or preachy saying, you know, you should be doing this and do that and do that, but really um, finding out where people are at um, and then seeing what it is that they need to be able to take a step forward. And that's the same whether we're working with a three-year-old or working with a 30-year-old or a Um, 60-year-old, really having a look at saying, okay, well, what is inspiring you right now in nature Um, and we'll have a look and see what they connect with Um, and then okay well what's the next step forward um, for you and then offering some support and whether that's us modeling it ourselves or do something crazy ourselves um, to join in that fun and give that energy and that support and that confidence Um, and then supporting them to take that you know next little baby step along the way um, and it's been really interesting to see how that works with three-year-olds or adults um, or teenagers, you know, in, in between. Um, and I think that mentoring philosophy of ours with Nature Connection is something that we hold really strongly. And that comes from our teaching style as well. So when we were classroom teachers, we were also mentors and analysing each individual child and what their needs were. Yeah, yeah, well said. I think it's probably important to dive into, you know, why nature is important in children's lives. So we've touched on the fact that often, you know, some children, some of their parents haven't even had enough experiences with nature, but also, you know, why is it important? Why did you see those changes in your classroom, Trudy, when you started doing more outdoor learning? Well, we've been um, reading a lot of uh Peter Gray and um, some of the other childhood anthropologists around and there's been um, a lot of study over the last couple of decades about how children have evolved and animals for that matter over time and in different cultures around the world and they've seen some commonalities in that kind of play and been analysing well why is it that we've been designed to play this way And, of course, it's playing out in nature because, you know, thousands of years ago we didn't have houses and we didn't have digital devices. We were, you know, living in a cave or a hut built out of sticks and clay and we had a very, very strong connection with nature and community and that this community and type of play in nature and connection was the way that children used to learn how to survive and how to be part of that community. So there's been some really interesting studies and one thing that we're really passionate about with is um, tool use. And um, I remember this um, study in archaeology looking at um, like like flint stones and looking at axe heads and that kind of thing. And they look at in the centre there's the master builders and then the next ring out is the apprentice builders of these tools. And then on the really outer ring you see the children's work because the children are looking at what the adults are doing in the world and then they're replicating and playing with that and experimenting with those materials, seeing what those materials do and seeing how they can be part of and transform the things that are around them in nature. And that's their natural way of learning. Um, And, you know, if you look at uh, traditional Aboriginal culture as well, the knowledge that the um, people have of nature Um, and what they're passing down to their children in terms of nature learning, nature stories and nature connection is much more than a person with a PhD in botany, for example, because there's so much that you need to um, (laughs) inherently know to be able to survive in that kind of world. And I think further to that, it comes back to um, Richard Louv's phrase that he he coined, uh, nature deficit disorder, in that we're living in an, an age at the moment we, where we are as far removed from nature as we ever have been in history um, and we need to get back to that opportunity where we're learning from nature 
And I think um, we're at a point in history where there's a lot of um, connection with nature that is about nature uh, education. So it's about environmental education or it's about the scientific integration um, or access to nature. But we've lost that connection and that heart sense um, to what nature means for us. And we see that using play is a fundamental way, not only for children but also for adults, for us to reconnect with nature on a, on a different level, um, more than just knowing the names of plants and animals um, and knowing the, I guess, the um, botanical uses of, of plants and animals as well. So it's about really connecting with what nature can provide for us. Yeah, and when we've got that true connection, it makes sense that we actually are more invested in preserving it and, and therefore we're actually going to be um, better advocates ourselves of looking after our environment. Absolutely. Yeah, so David Sabell says that we need to ask a child or help a child fall in love with the earth before we can ask them to save it. Um, and more uh, specifically, we need to ask them and support them to learn and connect with their local environment before we can ask them to save the rainforests in a country that is not connected to them. So it's about um, really connecting to place and space as well. So also seeing the purpose of, or, or the definition of nature, that nature is not just that beautiful um, national park or um, Uluru or, um, yeah, big rainforests, that nature is actually the, the space in that local pocket park down the road from you, that it's um, in your front and backyard. In fact, it's on your porch um, and that we as humans are nature. So reconnecting with ourselves as well is really important. What I love hearing is um, when people come to us and mm. say that they've realised now um, how their feeling and emotions have changed when they go in nature and that they try and implement that a little bit more in their lives. I remember one story from one of my playgroups and this family would come and join us at the river once a fortnight and the mum would say to me, oh, my little child has come and every morning wakes up and says, are we going to the river today, mum? Are we going to the river today? And they put a practice in a place where they'd go down to the river three times a week as um, some quality time they'd spend together. Um, and she was saying that it was amazing how her level of anxiety uh, changed and she felt more calm and relaxed. And when she went to the river in the morning, the rest of the day just sort of fell into place. It didn't have that frenetic kind of energy about it. And we're getting more and more adults coming and reflecting on this with us and actually children um, talking to us about how they're really enjoying the day um, and feeling chilled out and it's the best day of their lives and comments like this uh, because they're actually acknowledging the value of nature and what it does to their, themselves, their bodies and their emotions and their mindset. Um, and when we see nature have an effect on us like that, then we start to value it. And that's when we get really angry if something happens to this space, which has given us such a good feeling. And then on top of that is the bonus that um, nature and play yeah. in nature has so many therapeutic values as well that are hidden um, and that just happen as a part of being in nature. So we're developing um, core muscle strength. We're developing the, the um, muscles in our arms and our um, back girdles uh, and our shoulders that are all actually pre-literacy development um, skills and levels that help the learning process for children. Um, so if we provide opportunity to play in nature, these things come as a bonus rather than having to spend um, time in occupational therapy later in a child's life. So as well as having the play and that um, really deep connection with space, there's also academic values um, and development values as well. Yeah, and it's creating that space, I suppose, where children are then in the lead role. And I guess it's it's sad to say, but in a lot of in a lot of situations, children don't have opportunities to seek out what feels good to them. But in nature, you know, even just as a family, if you if you go to the play cafe, there's kind of a set way you do things. Whereas if you go to the the park or if you go to the beach, it's a lot more open ended. And so you see children really tap tapping into what feels good to them a whole lot more with that lack of structure. I think that's why our school holiday program has been so popular with the kids and that why they've been saying it's the best day of their lives because of the way we structure it. So we structure it in a way that it forms community at the start through playing games and 
you know, learning each other's names and creating little groups. But then the rest of the day is really quite free and we have resources out that can help them connect to nature in different ways, whether it's through carpentry or building cubbies or making rafts. Um, and there's an option to come and help, you know, cook lunch if you want to engage in that way. And then we don't really call on them to have to do something until the very end where we, you know, ask to clean up and share stories. So you've got this big bulk of the day where the children are supported in playing the way that they want to play, you know, the way that they instinctively feel that they need to play in community and nature. Um, and that sense of freedom um, has done a amazing things for some of the kids and parents have said what have you done to my child they've come (laughs) home and they can't stop talking they're exhausted and dirty but they've just got light and fire in their eyes for you know having such a fantastic day you know and the kids that come to our after school club once a week some of the parents been saying they're different at school now you know that their level of anxiety has decreased because they've got this one outlet a week for just two hours a week where they can actually be kids. And I think it comes down to um, empowering children and actually saying yes. So as the adult facilitators, we say yes to children and we give them opportunity um, by the resources we have available, by the time we give them. But then using uh, those opportunities in nature, nature itself says yes. So like you just mentioned, Claire, that... um, the difference between being in a natural space to a, a, a created space or a um, human developed space, nature provides the opportunity to say yes um, in so many different ways and the resources and opportunities that are created in that space empower the children and give them opportunity. It's crazy the amount um, of time for children that are structured mm-hmm. now. So we had a camp last week and I was talking to a nine-year-old boy at the end of the camp um, that we were running for a school in a place just out of Perth. And he said that he loved the camp so much his favourite part of the camp was rest. And um, this really surprised me because this is something that we've done that's quite structured for us. Um, in that we're running activities for four and a half hours per day and um, the activities, the children have to do something particular, although we leave space within them um, that time for them to act it out in their own way. Um, But there is one task to complete. And I was thinking if we're doing this in such a structured way on a camp um, and we're still demanding their time and this is rest and unstructured for you, that's crazy. You know, so there's so much structure out there and the children are just aching for this time. And one study we've read recently um, saying that kids actually have less than half an hour after school now for free play outside in nature. And that's what they need. That's what they've been designed to have. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah. That's it. They, need, they need a childhood, don't they? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, I mean, that- we need a childhood. We're getting in the way with our homework and with our own schedules and, and not valuing nature. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one reason why we're working with teachers is because parents have a really busy schedule. The after school time is really busy. So, we're trying to work with parents to help them see that we need to reduce the amount of stuff that we put in a child's afternoon. But if we can also work with teachers to see, well, opportunities need to exist within the school day because there's not enough hours in the after-school time for giving children time in nature and time to play. So we need to see that that's actually a benefit to the um, child coming back into a classroom if we do provide opportunities for them outdoors. I mean, the the state of recess and lunch at the moment that has become so small and so restricted, um, we've restricted the time that children have to sit and eat and then they can go off and play. They don't actually have time to get into play They don't hit that peak activity level where their brain um, is ready for actual play. They get to that that time and we call them back inside um, and we're wondering why we've got classrooms where children are um, distracted or or not able to pay attention. So if we can find opportunities to use the outdoors uh, and to use the outdoors for learning as well, then we are finding space and time to connect with nature and have that time in our school day as well. And so what would you say would be a good starting point, Daniel? Would, would it be an outdoor classroom? Would it be? 
you know, longer play times, where would be a good starting point to get that happening? I think definitely uh, longer recess and lunch. I think that's a number one spot where we need to start. But even as simple as uh, something we tell teachers all the time is if they do reading, hopefully they're doing reading every day in their class, take that book outside. So often we do that, that class reading time where we're either reading to the class or we're giving children time to read themselves. Take that outside under a tree. Even if it's just outside on a veranda or just outside the classroom or if there's a space at the end of the oval with beautiful shade, take it down there. And that simply is a first step that we can take. Um, It's interesting. We've had some teachers say that they have tried that. And um, during the story, they had distracted kids because there were ants crawling around them. And we celebrated that because um, we've got an opportunity for nature connection. So put the book down and then follow the ants. And then, hey, let's, when we go back into the classroom, let's look for some resources or some books on ants and use that as inspiration for further learning. Um, But yeah, that first step of actually just picking up what you do and going outdoors is a really important step. And I'm guessing that you would advocate for that regardless of the weather. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, We're coming up to July um, school holidays at the moment and uh, we get lots of questions. Oh, do you still run programs when it's raining? And we have to say some of our most exciting uh, programs that we've run are whole days in the rain. And it comes back to that permission, Um, whether it's our playgroups or our Uh, programs for older children, our Kin Village, um, children often don't have permission to be in rain. Um, Or if they do, they need their raincoats and and it's um, to get from A to B. But when we have an opportunity just to um, play in rain, it brings about such joy um, and a whole new experience of what nature means. Um, So yeah, we've had some wonderful days where we've set up giant tarps to provide a space to retreat to because that's important because being in the rain is a a very large sensory experience and sometimes can overload our senses. So you need a space to retreat from that. But then permission to have shoes off um, and have a change of clothes so you can get completely wet and play in rain is so important. We talk about something called sensory risk-taking and I had a very wet um, play group last week and um, it was very much a sensory risk-taking ex- exercise because it was one of those rains that just comes down without any warning. And so we all hid under tarps. Um, and then it was really exciting because this little pathway next to us turned into this milky, limestoney, sandy river that was like a raging flood. Um, and so then I leapt out with some of the kids and <clears throat> said, let's play in the river. Can we make a dam? And um, it was great because a lot of kids really got into that and it was changing and playing. Um, and, and then suddenly you saw a few kids just start to get really, really scared and I'm really horrified about the sense of the rain on them. And it was really interesting to see the parents' reactions. So I had a couple of mums worried about illness um, and their kids getting sick, so decided to take their kids home. And I had um, one parent who said, oh, my child's not very good with different tactile things, um, and he's just started to cry and take them home. So one thing I think that parents need to get a little bit braver at is not um, – jumping on a child's emotive change straight away. So if a child gets really, really upset, um, often they'll change that activity or to remove the environment that is making the child upset. Whereas um, we encourage the parents to, okay, well, let's just take a step back. So rather than removing that environment st- straight away, how can we turn that big step, which was obviously too much for the child just now, into, okay, let's take a step back under the tarp again um, and and calm down and then let's just stick our hand out under the rain or let's put a bucket out under the rain see if we can catch it just to allow the child to calm down a little bit and then become brave again to um, access that sensory risk-taking because it is quite scary if you come across something that you're not used to um, for the first time or in in a very um, full-on way that you haven't experienced before. Um, And after this downpour of rain, we went for a a great little adventure and made arrows through the bushland. Um, And when we came back, we had clay, and clay is something that we bring along because in WA, in Perth, it's very sandy and we don't have many sticky soils where we are. So we bring clay in 
and um, we were making arrows out of the clay, but not many children wanted to touch the clay. And I think that was because we had downpour of rain and then we were crawling through bushes so the children were already on this very big sensory overload um, of that day of exploring new things with their tactile and um, the other senses that they have that they don't normally use that much inside a sterile house. Um, so, you know, that just got too much. So it's about just having a few different things one at a time that we can encourage children to be brave, try something new um, and give it a go again. Not say, oh, my child doesn't like that and then try and ignore yeah. and remove that barrier all the time. And it, That doesn't help resilience. Yeah, so uh, we talk a lot about um, the different senses that we have. So one of them is actually nociception, which is our sense of pain. Um, and I think we underestimate that sense a lot in our society because actually the sense of pain is not just something that is um, extremely painful. It's any sensation that we have um, on our body or in our body that um, is a way to activate that sense. So being in a big downpour or having lots of mud on your skin is actually a way for us to experience that sense um, and, I guess, exercise that sense just like a muscle. We need opportunities to um, experience that and develop that sense and get used to it to be able to give us opportunity later in life to, yeah, be okay with different sensory experiences. Mm. So one thing that we, um, Daniel and I saw teaching um, an increase in the last decade is something called sensory processing disorder. And one in 20 children in Australia um, are diagnosed with this disorder, but we think it's um, quite a lot more than that in actuality. And it's where children um, are not able to filter the different inputs that they're having in their sensory system. So either they're not um, taking in enough inputs that they need to be aware of their surroundings or that they've got too many inputs and that becomes an overload because their filters in their brain aren't working. So we need to expose children to this um, different kinds of sensory um, environments so that their brains can be wired to deal with different information. Oh, that's so true. And I think we were talking earlier in the conversation about um, you guys in your role as mentors, but in actual fact, the the parents or the carers are being a mentor for their children. Their children are often looking to them for that reassurance that something is okay, something is safe. You know, let's you know, let's persist for a bit longer. Or as you were saying, Trudy, let's retreat and just you know feel the raindrops on our hand. But if parents are too tapped into you know, responding quickly and wrapping children in cotton wool as a general theme, mm -hmm. then I guess the messages that are going between the parent and the child aren't really helpful to either. No. Um, and, look, most parents um, have been fantastic with their kids and we can see them um, doing some really gentle encouragement, which is great. And so we just need to keep reminding parents that, you know, your child's going to be okay and um, it's just about baby steps and seeing, well, what is your child like now? That's not going to be forever. And what's the next little baby step that's going to help them take the next little risk they need in their lives? Brilliant. I wish you guys were in Adelaide. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd love to come and visit, Claire. <laughs> Okay, let's see if we can tee it up. But, yeah, I'd love to do the whole shebang, your nature days and everything. So maybe this is a good time to tell us more about your Educated by Nature programs and where we can find you online. Awesome. So uh, we have a brand-new website that we've just um, launched, actually. So it's www.educatedbynature.com, and we've got all of our programs on there, um, whether it's for families, our um, playgroups for young children or our school holiday programs for 7- to 14-year-olds our after-school bush inventors club um, that happen at different locations around Perth uh, weekday afternoons, but then also school incursions for um, teachers and local communities, local councils, and then also professional learning workshops. Um, so we've got, yeah, a, a lot of different ways that people can interact with us here at Educated by Nature, and we love getting out and spreading the message of how important it is to build uh, resilience through connection. 
Well, thanks, Daniel, and thanks, Trudy. I love your passion for this topic, and I love the knowledge that you have behind it. And as I said before we started recording, it's a topic that I'm I'm right behind, but we've never really delved into it on the podcast, so I think there's a lot of value there for the listeners as well. Awesome. Thank you, Claire. So that's the end of episode 67 of the Thriving Children podcast. Between now and next week's podcast, enjoy a moment or two in nature. Thanks for listening to the Thriving Children podcast. For even more goodness, visit thrivingchildren.com.au.